This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, so uh, our next uh, topic is the logistic of uh, Belatasip. As you have seen, as you know, Belatasip was approved in 2011 for uh, prevention of rejection, and we have been involved in many ex uh, clinical trials. David Wachowski has been uh, overseeing the clinical use of uh, Belatasip at UCSF, and he'll present our initial experience. Thank you, Flavio. So I think I'm the only thing standing between the break, right? So I have to uh, talk quickly. Oh, the bottom. Oh, yeah, thank you. OK, great. So as Flavio said, the topic is the logistics of Bilatisept. And I thought quite a bit about exactly what I would speak of. Um, the logistical part really is a couple of slides which we'll go through, but I thought it might be more interesting to actually review with everybody what our experience so far has been since this drug has been approved and how we've used it and how we um, came up with our patient selection criteria and our actual protocol that we are utilizing uh, when we use this drug. So just as a matter of review, um, just to remind everybody, Bilatisip is a fusion protein um, given as a IV infusion. It provides co-stimulation blockade by binding to the CD80 and 86 receptor on the antigen presenting cell. And um, there were two phase three studies uh, that were published, um, and we have data up to three years that's available in the literature. Uh, the first, uh, called Benefit, looked at patients who received a uh, deceased donor renal transplant from a standard criteria donor or from a living donor. And I think the big excitement with Bilatisept in particular was the um, benefit seen in the renal function. So if you look at the patients treated with Bilatisept compared to those treated with cyclosporin, there was a significant um, uh, increase or a difference between the EGFR between the two groups favoring uh, Bilatisept therapy. And the same thing held true in Benefit EXT, which was a study in patients receiving a expanded criteria donor kidney uh, donation for cardiac death kidney or a kidney with cold, uh, um, with long cold ischemia time, more than 24 hours. And again, although both curves are shifted down, meaning a slightly lower GFR, there's still a significant difference between those with uh, bilatisib treatment compared to those who received cyclosporin. One issue, um, the first issue, I guess, that came up in the trials, however, was uh, concern about increased risk of rejection, and this was certainly something we thought about when we were designing our protocols. You can see that um, if we just look at the Bilatisept LI, that's the lower intensity group, that's the regimen that was actually approved for use. Um, there was a trend toward um, more uh, rejections, and uh, they all occurred within the first year of transplant, whereas in the cyclosporin group, there are a few more rejections that continue to occur at year two and three. And the same thing held true, really, in the um, Benefit EXT trial uh, with a numerically higher number of rejections uh, compared to cyclosporin. But the thing I found interesting uh, about these rejection episodes, when you look at patients treated with Bilatisept who had rejection, they actually still had better GFRs compared to patients treated with cyclosporin who did not have rejection. So I, I think it shows that although you do have a slight decrease in your GFR um, in the Bilatisept group with rejection versus no rejection, it's still better than what you achieve with cyclosporin without rejection. The second issue that came up with uh, Bilatisept in the trials was the issue of PTLD. And in the benefit trial, there were a total of six uh, PTLD, PTLD events that occurred, three in the um, more intense regimen and two in the less intense and one in cyclosporin. One out of six of those were EBV seronegative, um, one out of six received thymoglobulin, and two out of six uh, were EBV negative and received thymoglobulin. So um, meaning that four out of six of the patients had known risk factors for PTLD. In Benefit EXT, there were a total of five PTLD events up to year three. 
and four out of five of those involved the CNS, um, so that was raised as a concern. And three out of five of those patients were EBV seronegative. So it looked like um, being EBV seronegative was uh, definitely a risk factor, uh, as well as the possibility of uh, adding in uh, lymphocyte depleting therapy on top of that. So as you all know, the drug was ultimately approved in Ju uh, June of 2011 by the FDA. Uh, it's approved for de novo use in kidney transplant recipients for rejection prophylaxis for EBV seropositive recipients uh, and used as part of a CNI sparing regimen. So when the drug uh, was approved as a center, we obviously had a lot of experience utilizing it as part of a research study, but I think we had to take a step back and decide exactly how we would utilize it in a more real-world population. So our first step really was trying to figure out who were going to be the patients that we would consider for um, bilatisep use. So the first thing, obviously, was we had to stick to the EBV seropositive. I think the data bears that out, as well as the uh, uh, FDA approval. But we really wanted to mainly focus on uh, more low immunologic risk patients, which when you looked at the benefit, benefit EXT trials, th those were really the patients that ultimately were enrolled. We had some exclusion criteria that we thought uh, uh, made sense um, for utilizing a new agent. We excluded prior transplants, uh, excluded patients obviously enrolled in a clinical trial. Our PRA cutoff was 30%. We wanted patients who did not have any positive donor-specific antibodies. We excluded uh, patients who had end-stage renal disease due to FSGS. So you heard Flavio's uh, comments about uh, the potential benefits of uh, calcineurins. Uh, we also excluded IgA. There's also some data that there may be some benefit with uh, using uh, calcineurin inhibitors in that patient population. And we excluded lupus. It was perhaps a little bit of a soft call, but we were worried about the slight potential increased risk of rejection. We also excluded pediatric M block recipients. As you know, those kidneys really can't be biopsied early on, so if you do have a concern for rejection, we really have no, uh, no way to look for it or try to identify it. And then some practical issues obviously came up. If you have a patient who has a known history of difficult IV access, that would not be the best candidate to receive a monthly infusion. And then uh, some of our patients, um, you know, can report some difficulties with travel, getting to infusion centers. Um, so we looked at that as a consideration. And then you have to think about the insurance issues. Uh, now, what I've been told is that, in general, um, our nurses and clinic are telling me that um, it's not an issue getting it approved if uh, you have a, a private insurance. Medi-Cal also has it on their formulary, so we can get that approved. It seems like the big issue is if you're Medicare only, um, you often will have a 20% copay. So that can be obviously a cost prohibitive issue and something we need to take into account when we're selecting potential candidates. So then we go beyond our patient selection. We have to think, well, what is the regimen or protocol we're going to follow? Because we know in the studies they used a fairly standard regimen of uh, basiliximab induction, MMF maintenance, corticosteroid maintenance, uh, and then the bilatisept um, protocol. But uh, we wanted to look at whether that was really the best regimen given the increased risk of rejection that we were worried about uh, based on the um, phase three trials. So this study caught all of our attention. This is a phase two trial that actually looked at using uh, bilatisept as part of an early cortical steroid withdrawal regimen. And they used thymoglobulin induction, uh, early cortical steroid withdrawal, and then randomized patients to receive bilatisept and MMF, bilatisept and serolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, or the comparator group, which was uh, tacrolimus and MMF. And as you can see, there was a very low rate of rejection in the bilatisep serolimus group comparable to what was seen in the uh, standard or gold standard group, uh, but yet you still preserve the renal benefits um, by using bilatisept in combination with serolimus. So the protocol we came up with, uh, which we thought made sense based on available uh, data in the literature, was to use uh, thymoglobulin induction um, at a lower dose, however, at three milligrams per kilogram. And for our maintenance regimen, we decided that we would allow patients to be considered for early cortical steroid withdrawal if they otherwise met our usual criteria. MMF for one month, followed by conversion to Everolimus, uh, which is an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, and the table below demonstrates the bilatisept dosing regimen, which was based on the lower intensity regimen used in the phase three trials. So now we come to the logistics, and honestly, it is just a couple of slides, and then we'll get on to our experience. So the first issue is you have to identify who's a candidate because the pharmacy staff on the inpatient side needs to know who's going to get this medication um, because it has to be prepared. It's an IV infusion. 
So that actually turns out to not be all that difficult. So once we identify a candidate, pharmacy is able to get this ready for us, and we're able to get the patient the medication that they need while they're in the hospital. I think the trickier part comes in as an outpatient. So what we have been doing thus far is having patients receive the infusion at UCSF for the first few months. Um, and that allows us uh, to buy some time so our nurses in the clinic um, can try to find the patient a local infusion center where their infusions can then be transitioned. Um, and one thing that's been set up um, um, by the company who's the manufacturer via a third party is something called the MyNewLogix Network. MyNewLogix is the brand name of Bilatacept. And this is a network that does assist our, our clinic nurses in um, finding infusion centers as well as uh, helping them navigate the insurance authorization process. And then also, uh, very important is we have to make sure we coordinate this with all of you as the referring physicians so everyone is on board with the plan and understands what the logistics and uh, the timing of these infusions would be. I'm sure somebody will have a cost question, so I thought I would just preempt it and put the slide up now. So one of our inpatient pharmacists, Jennifer, gave me the average wholesale price. So I'm told it's $664 per 250 milligram vial. You saw the dosing regimen. The, the maintenance regimen is five milligrams per kilogram, so you can do the math for a standard 70-kilogram um, person. You're meant to round the dose up or down to the, cl to the closest number divisible by 12.5. That's what they recommend, which that's higher math than I can do, so thank God we have the pharmacists. Uh, and there have been estimates that I've seen that suggested it can cost up to $25,000 per year, and I guess you have to put that in the context of uh, Jennifer also provided me the cost of um, generic tacrolimus, which, if I remember correctly, was about twenty or twenty-five dollars for one hundred one milligram tablets. Um, but there's also the cost of uh, uh, trough measurements, um, and uh, obviously patients are on a higher dose than one milligram of tacrolimus, so the cost is slightly different than that uh, cost per hundred. Lastly, in terms of logistics, you have to deal with uh, the REMS program. You heard about that with Cellcept. Uh, there's also a REMS program for Bilatacept, and that's uh, due to the uh, PTLD issues. Um, so that's also something that we uh, have to handle when we see these patients uh, after transplant uh, while they're still um, getting their infusions with us. So let's talk a little bit about our experience. I kind of broke this down into three groups. Um, the first group is our use of the medication de novo, which is the approved use. We have uh, 18 patients uh, since its approval that have received this drug de novo. And uh, you can see that uh, half were male. Our average age was about 58, which I always find it interesting. Whenever I do any summaries of anything that we've done in our actual patients, it's always like 10 or 15 years older than anything in a study. The average age, I think, of benefit was 43. So uh, definitely a slightly different population. Um, most of the patients received deceased donor kidneys. Um, they were low immunologic risk with a CPRA of 4.8%, and um, cold ischemia times were less than 10 hours for um, the deceased donors. In terms of what we ended up giving them, uh, most did get thymoglobulin. I will give a little disclaimer. Um, the first few patients that received this drug de novo, we didn't quite have a, a formalized protocol in place, so we were going with the phase three recommendations um, in terms of what they used. So a couple patients did, received, uh, did receive basiliximab. Uh, most patients ended up on a steroid maintenance regimen. Most were converted to everolimus. However, two were switched off of everolimus due to some side effects. One patient had oral ulcers that developed. Another patient actually developed hyperglycemia, which interestingly did not get better when they were switched back to MMF. The patient still remains on a oral hypoglycemic. And then there were three patients who were converted to, to Crolimus from Bilatacept, um, two due to rejection and one due to IV access issues that developed um, two months in. And we'll talk a little bit more about the rejection in this next slide. We saw a total of three acute rejections, um, one uh, type 1B, uh, 1-2A, and 1-2B. Um, for the, two, for the 1B, uh, it occurred on day 56, and the patient did receive thymoglobulin. Um, for treatment, as well as converted back to uh, tacrolimus. But their six-month management biopsy was actually completely normal. The 2A uh, rejection occurred fairly early on day 34. That patient also received um, thymoglobulin uh, treatment. And actually, that patient unfortunately lost their graft about a month later. Um, you'll see lower down, that patient uh, developed a fairly bad pyelonephritis and bacteremia and was septic and had a pretty bad ATN. Uh, afterward, and I think on top of the rejection and then that event, um, 
the, unfortunately we, we did lose the graft. Um, the type 2B rejection occurred on day 93. That patient also received thymoglobulin and was converted back to ProGraph. The one thing I want to add about this, which I found very interesting, the three rejections, uh, none of them were actually um, on Everolimus. They never got converted. So I don't know how that's going to play out as we gain more experience with this. We do know that when you add Everolimus to Bilatisept, you um, add an mTOR inhibitor, I should say, to Bilatisept, you lower the risk of rejection. So we'll have to see if that's a trend that continues. In terms of infectious complications, we saw a few viral URIs, two UTIs, uh, the one pyelonephritis bacteremia that I mentioned, uh, no CMV, one BK, and uh, we did have the one graph loss that I mentioned from the rejection and the infection issues. But strikingly, um, the EGFRs um, are, I think, quite impressive. When you look on the right side, the living donors, um, their EGFR at one month was 57. Uh, it was 57 at three months, and it rose um, into the high 60s by month six. And we also have very good EGFRs for the ECD, DCD uh, recipients. Um, the standard deceased donor uh, group, I'm not sure how to explain that the drop at the six months. There's only two patients. Uh, I, I can tell you one of the kidneys was one of the other patients with rejection. And when I looked back, there was also some chronicity on that biopsy uh, at the time that was done. So it looked like there was some donor disease as well. So we'll have to see how that looks as more patients um, go forward in time. So that's our de novo experience so far. So the next way we've, we have utilized this drug is with conversion. Now this is uh, you know, technically off-label, I suppose, because it's approved for de novo use, but I think conversion is something that people have often thought of with this drug because of the ability to get them off CNIs. So the only published literature that I'm aware of looking at conversion actually was a phase two study um, with stable renal transplant recipients. So that's the key word I want to focus on. They were stable renal transplant recipients who were six to 36 months post-transplant. And they were randomized to stay on their CNI or convert to bilatisept. And again, much like we've seen in other bilatisept studies, the EGFR actually increased and was superior in those patients who received bilatisept uh, as part of the conversion regimen. Now, we have not done this in, quote, stable renal transplant recipients per se. We've done this in... Um, two groups that I'm going to talk about. The first group is what I've been calling prolonged DGF conversion. So these are those patients that we all know and, and we see after transplant who are two or more weeks out. They're still on dialysis or their creatinine is very suboptimal. We do a biopsy. There's ongoing ATN on the biopsy. Um, there's no rejection and we're sort of scratching our heads on what to do. We just sort of wait it out and hope they, they come off dialysis. So we looked at nine patients who were in that situation and we actually converted them to bilatisept um, off of their, their uh, CNI. Uh, and you can see six were male. The average age again was 58. They were all deceased donor kidneys. Um, the most common cause of renal failure was uh, GN. These patients were a little more sensitized than our de novo group. The mean PRA was 20, and they had a longer cold ischemia time of 11.7 hours. In terms of their immunosuppression, um, five received thymoglobulin. Um, all were in corticosteroid maintenance. Um, the mean day of uh, tacrolimus initiation was 2.3 with a range of one, 1 to 5. And then the mean day of uh, bilatisept initiation was day 46 with a range of 13 to 74. And one patient ultimately did have to get, did have to be converted back to uh, tacrolimus from bilatisept um, due to some infectious issues, which I'll talk about um, with the next slide. In terms of rejection, um, we saw three type 1A rejections, and this was very interesting because they were all subclinical rejections. So these were all found on protocol biopsies at month six. So no patient had a biopsy that was done for cause that demonstrated rejection. Uh, they were all treated with uh, cymedrol, um, and two initially received thymoglobin induction and one received uh, basiliximab induction. We had two biopsies that showed borderline change. Uh, one biopsy was a management. That patient did not receive any treatment. Another patient, uh, the biopsy was done as a cause biopsy, and because there was some borderline change, the patient was treated with steroids, um, and one received thymoglobulin, and one received uh, basiliximab induction. In terms of infections, we had one CMV viremia, one CMV colitis. We had no BK viremia. We had five UTI events in four patients. One C. diff and one candidemia and this 
sort of vague cavitary lung lesion. That was the patient I mentioned before, and the canademia was also in that same patient. So it was not clear completely what the cause of that infection was, um, but I can say that the patient was treated with uh, azoles and was improving. Um, but unfortunately, after I put these slides together, a few days ago, the patient actually, he was still in the hospital and he uh, had an aspiration event uh, and had an arrest and actually passed away. Um, so it's unclear, um, you know, how much our treatment regimen in terms of immunosuppression, you know, played into this whole course for him. And then we had one aspergillus uh, infection. So in terms of the renal function, um, you can see at week two, uh, the mean GFR was 14. On the day of bilatisip conversion, it was 19. 30 days post-conversion, uh, it rose to 45. And at six months, um, it was 52. So it continued to improve. And the thing I actually thought that was very interesting, when you um, put these patients in the order in which they were converted from earliest to latest, you can see a fairly clear trend that if you capture these patients earlier, you do get more bang for your buck out of the conversion um, strategy in terms of improvement in GFR um, 30 days post uh, uh, bilatisept infusion. <clears throat> so the second group of conversion is a bit of a hodgepodge, I have to admit. It's kind of like a potpourri slide here. So we have 16 patients that were converted for other reasons, so things beyond just prolonged EGF. So the reasons were CNI toxicity in six, three had CNI intolerance, meaning the patient had some side effects or some issues with uh, calcineurins, um, five had donor disease on biopsies, one patient developed NODAT and was converted, and again, just uh, so you know, that patient actually did not improve, they're, they're actually on insulin. Um, and one patient who actually had ischemia and evidence of infarction on uh, biopsy, so a lot of um, chronic disease in, in the kidney. Um, terms of cause of their renal failure, most were diabetic. Um, they were, again, unsensitized with a CPR of 4.7% uh, and a cold ischemia time of about 10 hours. And a half of the, pa uh, sorry, a um, little over half of the patients were male. So uh, six received thymoglobulin, 10 received Simulect or basiliximab induction. In terms of their steroid regimen, most were on maintenance. Um, they were all on uh, tacrolimus as their CNI at the time of discharge. And this is the tricky part of when we're trying to make conclusions about this group. When you look at the range of the date of conversion, it was anywhere from post-operative day 17 to post-operative day 1009. So it's very difficult, I think, to really try to tease out um, a lot of meaningful uh, information from this, uh, from this data. We did have some uh, rejections. Um, so we had management biopsies, one that showed a borderline rejection, one that showed a 1B. We had some cause biopsies that did have rejection, one had a 1A. And we had one patient that had um, actually three rejection events and ultimately went on to, to lose the graft. Um, the first event was treated with cymedrol. The two subsequent were treated with thymoglobulin. Um, then the patient also had um, a lot of uh, fibrosis and atrophy that started to develop, and it was just uh, completely resistant rejection. We had, we had another patient who had the original 1B on the, on the management who uh, went on to have uh, another recurrent 1B uh, on a cause biopsy. So there were a total of five graft losses. Um, um, and there were four or few death sensors. So we did have a patient who a few weeks after being converted actually had a cardiac event at home um, and passed away. Um, so we didn't think that really was related to the immunosuppression regimen per se, um, but, uh, but rather um, her history of uh, coronary disease. Um, when we look then at infectious issues, um, there were two CMV viremias, two BKs, um, six UTIs in five patients, three pyelonephritis events in two patients, a C. diff colitis, one uh, community-acquired pneumonia. And then we had a pulmonary mucor with uh, asp which <laughs> multiple concomitant uh, infections as well. Uh, there was also aspergillus identified as well as uh, positive influenza. Um, and that uh, patient was uh, one of the patients who also um, Lost their, lost their graft um, because of a initial rejection and then these infectious issues. In terms of the EGFR, however, um, you can see at the day of conversion it was 35. Um, 30 days post it was 41. Certainly not um, uh, a big rise like we saw in the DGF group. And again, I think um, 
I think the problem is with this group, it was so heterogeneous that we really have a hard time drawing conclusions. And I think when you look at the reasons why they were converted, many of them were converted uh, because of CNI toxicity on a biopsy or donor disease in a biopsy, meaning a lot of arteriosclerosis or, or a significant amount of IFTA or fibrosis and atrophy already present. So I think if the expectation is converting them to bilatisept when you have uh, issues like that, uh, that bilatisept is going to save the day in that situation, I think that might be an unrealistic expectation. So I think that's part of the reason why we didn't see as big of a gain in terms of the renal function and in terms of outcomes like we did with the prolonged DGF group who were a little bit more of a very defined patient population where we were trying to uh, implement an intervention. So I left this slide intentionally blank because I've been thinking quite a bit about what, what are the lessons that I've learned from this um, uh, looking at this data. So I think, I think I can safely say that we're pretty happy with our de novo results. I think we have a, a good protocol that we've implemented. I think um, we'll see how it plays out with the addition of the mTOR inhibitor. I think we're going to see pretty low rejection issues. We still have to continue to follow them along uh, and see what the safety and the infectious issues are over time. I think the prolonged DGF patients uh, also overall are doing well. We did have that uh, last patient with some infectious issues. Um, but I think it looks like that's a reasonable strategy, again, that we need to accrue some more patients and compare it to patients that were not converted um, for prolonged DGF to ensure uh, that, is, that it is a safe um, regimen for these patients. And then the last group, the hodgepodge group, uh, I think what I learned from there is if you really don't have a compelling reason to switch, then maybe sometimes you need to leave well enough alone, and sometimes you can do more harm than good by trying to make some aggressive changes. And I think we just need to look at patients very carefully before we make the decision to switch, um, switch them to a new medication, particularly um, in patients where it's not clear what the long-term benefit of that switch could be. So I think that's something that I learned from this and um, be happy to take any of your questions. Everyone wants to get to the break, right? All right, you can ask me while we're drinking coffee. <laughs>